I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Our, our presenter is uh, one of our presenters is Dr. Marisol Quintanella. She's an assistant professor in our soy and our, our uh, soybean nematolo nope, actually our nematologist. I focus on one past, Marisol, so please forgive me, but um, yeah, no problem. It, uh, she is our nematologist, but she will be focusing on soybean cyst nematodes today. Marisol? Yes. All right. Well, pleasure to, pleasure to talk to you guys. So good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Marisol, and um, I work on several nematodes in Michigan, but one of my focus is soybean cyst nematode. You can see in the picture here, of course, I'm in the middle, um, and the lady with the soil sampler, she's Sita Tapa, she's my postdoc, and she has done a lot of the um, soybean cyst nematode work. Um, I have my technician there. Anyway, I have a team. There's some people missing there because I have some new people. So let's get started. So soybean cyst nematode. Soybean cyst nematode is um, it's a very important soy, uh, nematode in soybean. It's the most important nematode in soybean that causes the most damage. And not only that, soybean cyst nematode is the number one yield robbing pathogen in soybean in North America. In other words, this is a very important pathogen. If you look at this picture, you can see those little white things or eggs on the roots. Do you guys see them? I can, I'm pointing them with my um, click. Can you see it, Mike? Can you see those little white dots? Yeah. So um, those little white dots are soybean cyst nematodes. You can see them with your naked eye. If you look here, you can see actually the nitrogen nodules. So they are maybe about one tenth or one fifth the size of a nitrogen nodule. They're, so they're much smaller than a nitrogen nodule, but they're still visible with the naked eye. And they almost look like grains of sand attached to the roots, you know, but but you can tell they're, they're, they're very round. You, you, um, you can definitely distinguish them for um, grains of sand. Grains of sand tend to be more angled, more squarish. So um, anyway, so let's go move to the next one. So a quick outline of the things that I'm going to talk about today. I want to talk about the management practice and rank, rank them. Um, for the management practice for soybean cyst nematode, the one of the number one things to do is to, first of all, don't get it. So if you um, sampling, sampling your field um, to, to know whether you have it or not. And if you don't, try to manage in a way of not getting them. Fortunately, nematodes don't fly. So um, like insects can fly. So you can keep them away from your field with some effort, like the uh, washing equipment before you go to a clean field, if, especially if you share equipment with other growers or other fields that are infected. Um, I think that's, the, that's the, pretty much the number one way. Anything that moves soil moves nematodes. So keeping soil from being moved to a clean field. Um, so number one, not get them. Once you have them, um, one of the uh, good practices is to manage um, to rotate resistant varieties. So use resistant varieties and rotate them. Um, and of course, rotate with non-host. So I would say those are the two, once you have them, the number two most key practices, the most key practices is to grow non-host such as corn or wheat, or almost, almost anything else besides something like dry beans rotate with almost anything else except um, soybeans, you know, corn, wheat, it's a, it's a typical example. So not grow uh, beans back to back, soybeans back to back. And another very important practice is to rotate sources of resistance, if you can. Most, res most varieties are PI8788. I would say that represents about 90% of the varieties in Michigan, or not in Michigan, in the United States. Um, they have the source of resistance for SCN 
um, derived from P8788. Um, so rotate this, if you can, with something like a Peking, and if you can't, with a different variety, uh, even if it's PI-788, but hopefully a different source of resistance. Some companies are coming out with some new sources of resistance, and that would even be better if you can rotate with three sources of resistance versus only two. Um, I wanted to let you know there is some soil um, uh, qualities that can favor SCN. High soil pH tends to favor SCN. So if you have high soil pH, you are more likely, if you have some fields that tend to have high soil pH, you are more likely to have severe problems. Also texture, sandy soils, coarse soils, even mud soils can have much higher SCN numbers than a heavier soil. So there is some things there, you know, uh, fields that you need to watch out for. Um, I have done some trials with manures that seem promising. Um, they're not the silver bullet. They don't remove the problem, but it does, some of them does help to reduce the problem. We've also done several trials with resistant variety rotations and cover crops. So um, I'm gonna get into that. So this slide here shows the management practices. Like I said, um, the most important management practice one is to collect soil samples and they know your numbers. Um, the, the ones to con, um, the send soil samples to is the MSU Plant Diagnostic Lab and the Michigan Soybean Promotion Committee through the soybean checkoff dollars will cover the cost of your samples. And you can test numbers of SCN and also um, HG type, meaning can your soybean systematode reproduce on the varieties you are growing, on the, on the source of resistance you are growing? Maybe I need to close the door because the storm is so loud. Maybe you guys hear the storm around. Yeah, I'm actually in Alabama in a, in, a, in a scientific meeting. So maybe it's not storming for you guys, but it's definitely storming for me. Um, some kind of hurricane. All right. so. Um, so, um, so collect soil samples, submit them to the plant bag. Can you hear me well, Mike? Yeah, yes, we can. All right. So, and um, so take samples, submit them to um, uh, the plant diagnostic lab, grow non host such as corn, wheat, or other small grains, um, grow resistant varieties, you see there? grow resistant varieties and rotate sources of resistance like the king. And um, another option is to use nematode protected seed treatment. That is not the most important management practice. These first three, um, keeping them off, growing non-host and growing resistant soybean varieties are the number one. Um, the chemicals can have an impact, can reduce can, can reduce your losses or reduce um, nematode numbers, but the difference is small, kind of um, the difference is small compared to the other practices I mentioned. So we have also done um, cover crop trial. This is the list of cover crops that we've evaluated. And here's a picture of the cover crops that we have tested. We actually test them in pots. And the main idea was to test, are there some cover crops that significantly reduce soybean cis nematode compared to other cover crops? Are there some that might act as trap crops? In other words, make this, um, the, the cis hatch and that way reduce the numbers, et cetera. Um, we've also tested um, manures, compost and manures. And uh, we have had, this is an example of our, uh, of our lab trial we put um, nematodes inside um, uh, vials with manure and with different in different proportions with soil and, and then extract the nematodes and see what percentage survive. And um, there, there's this different percentages composted manure. And you can see that some manures led to significant decrease of some nematodes in very high concentration, especially the poultry manure and the layer ash blend. But this is in very high concentrations. So um, 
in for, for let me see let me keep on oh my Okay, there, my slides are not moving as fast as I want. For um, uh, in, in soybean, in soy, in, in actually for soybean cyst nematode, we applied, um, we applied chicken manure to a field of corn, previous to corn. And you can see that we had a reduction of the manure versus the control um, the significance was only uh, oops, to the 90% level. So in other words, uh, we can say this, we're 90% sure instead of scientists usually like to say that they're 95% sure. Um, and, but uh, we did get a reduction, which is good news. All right, so this is other trials with manure and compost. I'm not gonna go into all the details. Um, so rotations of SCN resistant varieties, you can see in 2017, um, we started a trial in which we tested different sources of resistance for SCN. Peking, uh, and Peking I, I uh, abbreviated as PE, and um, a PI 788 I abbreviated as PI, and uh, susceptible as an S. So, uh, so you can see that Peking and PI uh, uh, the Peking and PI 788 they had equal yield yields per a, um, uh, bushels per acre on 2017 when we started the trial and also our nematode numbers were very similar in all these different plots when we started the trial. This trial was a randomized block design and we replicated this. Um, uh, four times, you know, so it's a, actually six times. So that means we do the same thing in different plots in order to make sure that whatever results we get, it's not a coincidence, but it's actually based because the system is working. All right, so you can see that by 2018, we start getting some separation and management practice. One is that our highest yield is in the rotation when we're rotating PI 8788 with Peking. Um, if we have PI 8788 back to back, we have a lower yield, um, um, like second highest. When we have Peking back to back, we have third highest. And when we have a susceptible, anything with an S, we have the lowest um, yield. And that is inversely true with nematode. These are nematode numbers. So you can see uh, PI 788 with Peking rotated back to back has the lowest numbers of nematodes and um, the highest yield. And then the PI 788 back to back, it has the second highest number of, nem I mean, the second lowest number of nematode and the second high, it's like perfectly related. You know, the higher your nematode numbers, the lower the yield. And the most effective practice up to this point in 2018 was rotating PI 8788 with Peking. This trend kept on going and kept on being obvious as we kept the trial going. We did this again, at, I mean, we uh, continued this until um, uh, we um, uh, until 2020, and it is a very clear conclusion um, uh, that the highest yield consistently was the. This is 2019. PI-788 rotated with Peking had the um, highest yield and uh, PI-878 back to back had the second highest and Peking back to back had the third highest. So let me, um, uh, so there's 2020 and you can see that um, uh, uh, pretty much the, the same scene uh, is happening, but these are actually cysts or nematode numbers. So the lowest number of cysts was in the Peking PI-878 Peking. In other words, we are rotating 
sources of resistance, PID serenaded with Peking, we have the lowest numbers of nematodes. We have the highest numbers of nematodes when we grow Peking back to back, and of course, susceptible. And even PI 878 back to back is higher than rotated the source sources of resistance. So, um, and the yield, the situation is pretty much the same as I mentioned before in 2020. So, the main thing that I want to mention is that the main conclusion, and we submitted a paper for publication, the main conclusion is that the most useful thing you can do is rotate sources of resistance. Do not, I'm not recommending to switch to Peking. Say Peking is a dream because the first time you grow it, you get a significant increase in yield. So Peking is a great tool, um, it, especially the first yield you get, if you have a SCN, especially the first yield, you get a um, uh, yield increase and a nematode decline, but that doesn't hold up in time. So if you, uh, if you only switch to picking, you, you're gonna have reduction of effectiveness. Same thing happens with PI-878, but a little bit slower. If you grow PI-878 back to back, you get a decline of yield and a reduction of effectiveness. But you that decline in yield and reduction of effectiveness is significantly slowed if you use the two sources of resistance. It's kind of the same concept as rotating your herbicides. I think many of us understand that using the same herbicide 20 years in a row makes for herbicide resistant weed, right, Mike? Right. Yeah. So um, rotating is important. So um, I'm just gonna skip some things. So, um, yeah, so we are continuing this work and um, uh, yeah, uh, we're continuing this work. I just wanna um, re re reiterate the main message to the, the number one, the, the most important management practice, collect soil samples from fields, know your numbers, submit it to um, the plant diagnostic map, grow non-host, such as corn, wheat, or small grains. Um, then grow resistant soybean varieties and rotate them. Um, hopefully you can get a PI-788 and Peking and rotate them. You can do something such as PI-878 this year, corn next year, and Peking on the third year. Or uh, you can also do a, a PI-878 this year, Corn next year, PI-878 um, the year after that, the third year, and then corn or wheat or whatever you want that is a non-host, and then picking. You can do two years of PI-878, one year of picking, or one year of PI-878, one year of picking with a non-host in between. Um, that is the most effective practice you can make to um, rotate with non-host, like in alternate years, and when you do grow soybean, try to switch it up. Switch up, hopefully the source of resistance. And if you find that impossible, at least a variety that is not as effective as looking at different source of resistance, but it's better than using um, this exactly the same thing because um, as you know, it's much easier to win a battle against someone that is very predictable. We want to change you, you, you want to um, reduce the predictability for the nematode so it doesn't adapt so easy, okay? Um, all right, so, and there's other things being investigated. I, and of course, I want to thank the SCN Coalition and number one, the Michigan Soybean Committee, change names, and um, I we did get a grant from North Central IPM and I'm ready for questions. Marisol, thank you very much. That was an excellent presentation. And I really like the emphasis and the prioritization of our management practices. And there are some questions. So um, first one, Marisol, you may have answered this already in the chat, but I would like to have you answer it yeah, verbally. I think I answered every question in the chat, Mike, but I'm happy to answer it verbally. 
That's great. There are many that are not uh, on a, uh, a tablet or computer. They may be on iPhones, and so they don't see the chat, Marisol. So we need yeah. to answer all the questions. Perfect. Yeah, I'm happy. Uh, I'll go ahead and read them, Marisol. Um, we'll start with this one from Phil. Uh, when you rotated between sources of resistance, did you also rotate soybean varieties? And when rotating, should we consider rotating varieties as well as the source of resistance? Um, okay. My answer is no and yes, because my objective was not rotating varieties, but rotating sources of resistance. Um, I, I grew like every year was a different variety of P8878 because I did this trial with a grower. And he, he didn't get every year exactly the same variety, but that was not the objective of what I analyzed. The main objective and my analysis was based on sources of resistance. So I cannot speak from my personal research saying that rotating varieties is helpful. That I have heard from others. What I can say from my personal research and my personal experience is that rotating sources of resistance, such as P8878 P8 and Peking, is an excellent tool to both increase yield and reduce nematode numbers, and that growing the same sources of resistance back to back leads to decreased effectiveness. That I can say. For the rotating varieties, I cannot say that from personal evidence because I have not analyzed that particular point, but I have heard it from others. Um, I do not think this is as important a strategy, not near as important a strategy as using different sources of resistance and most important, rotating with non-host, such as corn and wheat. All right, there you go. Very good. Thank you. We have another one from Eric. It's uh, what is the projected date for the release of the new source of resistance? Yeah, so um, that I don't know because um, the companies don't give me their secret, their top secret information. I don't have. Um, so I know that there is a couple companies with um, uh, with uh, varieties, well, sources of resistance. Actually, um, somebody might know more than I about this. Do you do you know do, do any of anybody in the panel know? You know, I, I do not know a projected date of release. I have not been informed about that. Um, uh, I know some are under evaluation. I have tried some some of them. Um, so no, I, I do not know. My guess is that it's not in the far distant future. Um, it's it's going to be, my guess is that this is going to be relatively soon. I'm talking about next couple of years, my guess, but that is just a guess. Good. Thank you. Marcel, we do have another one for you. This is from Mark. It's, uh, I've heard that SCN have higher reproduction rates in dry years. Do you expect that the dry areas of the state may have increased SCN populations more than normal? And should these be critical areas for soil sampling this fall? Um, yes, um, uh, the dry areas probably have higher soybean damage and might have had higher nematode reproduction. Um, and especially in areas where you have coarse texture soils, um, such as sandy soils or, or muck. Um, the only thing is that I do not think, and Jeff, you're probably way more expert about this than I, I do not think that the same areas that are dry this year will probably be the dry areas next year. So um, eh, if farmers, you know, if we don't sample at all in areas that are not so dry and they have high numbers, they, you know, we might miss some things, you know, for what could happen next year, because even though your numbers your numbers might not be quite as high. You know, SCN can reproduce very rapidly. Think about every every summer, you get about three or four uh, life cycles, depending on the weather, you know, and, you know, early spring, you know, the temperature. And every time a female reproduces, she makes like 
somewhere between 250 eggs. So imagine if we, let's say as humans, could reproduce in one summer three or four times, and every time you have kids, it's 250 kids. Mm. How many kids will you end up having in a summer? And then once you reproduce one time, you know, and you had 250 kids, those kids can reproduce and have 250 kids. So you can you can get very rapid population explosion. So um, I would say yes. I think there should be a focus in areas that have been dry, but um, without totally neglecting other areas. You know, my guess is you know, uh, especially farmers that are concerned, to make sure that they have good management practice for next year. Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Marisol. Uh, John asked a question, it's kind of related to Eric's, but I think it's uh, maybe not so much the date that new varieties would be, or new sources of resistance would be released, but are you aware of any work that's being done in, in trying to create uh, uh, new forms of SCN resistance? And are there multiple forms being created? Can you say that again, Mike? Are there, are there new sources of, well, the ex exact question, let me read it word for word. Are any newer forms slash varieties of SCN resistance being developed to augment the three or so that are currently exist? Are there any new varieties being developed to augment what that would exist? Yes. The, yeah, there's, there's new sources of resistance being evaluated because, you know, PI-788, is the resistance is based on a gene. And this gene, you know, the different varieties will have different numbers of copies of this gene. Peking is a little bit different. You know, the mechanism of resistance is a little bit different. And other sources of resistance, you know, they also come at the nematode from a different angle, you know? So yes, there's other sources of resistance in the pipeline, there's actually different sources of resistance that we know of from soybean, you know, from native soybeans in, 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 in China or in Asia that have different sources of resistance that are super effective. There's some sources of resistance that are crazy effective. The nematode cannot break it anyway, but the problem is that the yields are super low. So the objective, you know, what they're trying to do is get good SCN resistance with some of these different sources of resistance and at the same time get good yield. So this is what these companies are doing. So yes, there's there's new things in the pipeline. Thank you. Uh, Chris Defonso has a comment in here that I would like our listeners to hear. Um, rotation is a standard method of reducing or delaying weed, pathogen and insect resistance, not only to pesticides, but to BT crops and host plant resistant varieties. It's a good practice to work into your cropping systems whenever you can. That's Thank right. You, I mean, Chris is right. It is not only about nematodes. You know, uh, farmers are hit by all kinds of things and crop, rot I mean, res rotating of resistant varieties or rotating varieties helps with all kinds of things. And Marisol, rotating with non host Another question for you from Jason. Uh, with the extremely dry conditions, are SCN tests accurate, or should we wait for more soil moisture to sample sandy soils in southwest Michigan? Um, um, well, um, my guess is that if you get um, uh, uh, that you if you get soil with roots right by you know close to the soybean roots they should be accurate because soybean cyst nematode only grows, you know, only can feed on the roots. It's a, it's a strict phytoparasitic nematodes. In other words, it can't live, it can't feed freely. It has to feed on a plant root, in this case, soybeans. So sampling soil close to the soybean roots will, you, will give you um, uh, accurate results. I do not see why dry conditions will make uh, SCN tests less accurate. Maybe I'm missing something. Maybe there's something I don't know about. So I don't want to be total categorical about this, but um, I think it sh they should be accurate. Thank you, Marisol. This is a really upbeat note from Charles Scoville. 
uh, Golden Harvest is currently selling one of their varieties. It's a variety that does contain the new source of resistance. It's PI89772. And that is actually currently available. So Charles, thank you for that. That that answers that question. And I agree with Mark. I agree with Marisol, it really is the industry that, that's going to be uh, making us aware of these, these new breakthroughs. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. I think that wraps up all of our questions. Um, there was, uh, I actually asked Jeff Andresen a question earlier, and Jeff, if you wouldn't mind if you'd answer that again. We had really dry conditions in 2017, unusually hot conditions in 2017, and it caused the moisture to drop so significantly in our soybeans. Uh, we had, we were harvesting beans at 8%, 8-9% there. And so I was just wondering if these conditions that are forecast, these above normal temperatures might, uh, you know, are they going to, they probably won't match 2017, but uh, are they going to be really good drying conditions? And should we be watching our soybean moisture content? I, I, well, I, and we probably won't see the conditions we saw in 2017, which were an extreme. But that said, and I, I'm following um, corn dry down right now in a, a project out at the, here on campus. And I've been amazed at how fast and how rapidly that has dried up. So what I said originally, we, we need to be keeping an eye on things are, are, are moving very, very rapidly, given, uh, given these conditions. We had some rain here in some parts of the state that, that will change that at least temporarily. But over the last several weeks, we have seen advanced phenology. Things are moving much more quickly than they typically do. So I, I think you're, we need to be keeping an eye on on things out there, they may be it may be uh, drier than you think. Uh, if you're if you're well, you should be be watching that fairly closely. But but the uh, what I have seen in corn is is actually pretty pretty impressive uh, in terms of of drying off. It's just going to save people money, but it's moving moving rapidly. And given the forecast for the next one to two weeks, probably more of uh, of the same. So things things are going to be ahead of where they typically are for uh, for late September. Good. Jeff, is there any prediction for harvest? I know sometimes rainfall yeah. evens out, you know, in a calendar year. Right. Are, are we going to have some wet conditions or dry conditions for October? How do we, how do we look? Well, as, as we mentioned here for the short term, uh, at least for the northern part of the state, probably over the next 24 hours. But, but then for, for other folks uh, farther south, probably not till the middle of next week. But we're in a pattern. I, I think that we'll probably see less frequent rain. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, the big message, though, is is warmer than normal mean temperature. And so, uh, again, we we we're less less there was a disaster this spring in, in some localized areas. We we should not see any problems with crops having enough uh, season, enough warmth to finish off normally or ahead of normal. Most most everything is is really ahead of normal. And as we look into the harvest, uh, well, advanced dry down, all those things are going to be earlier than normal. Uh, than they typically are in a year like this. So right now, at least in terms of the crop that's out there, uh, I, I don't see any problems. Actually, it's, it's maybe a bit of an advantage. I would be maybe more watching the crops that are going to come, the fall crops and getting those going and having, having adequate moisture to get good establishment or germination and good establishment. I think that's the next question. If, it, if this dryness or warmth and dryness does continue, that, that will be one of the questions. Is there any guidance further out? Uh, Phil Cates asked, what's the long-term yes. weather outlook? It, it is consistent with what we're seeing now. It's, it's for warmer than normal mean temperatures and well into the, for the remainder of the fall. And then as we will talk about this next week as well, but uh, we're looking at, at probably the development of another, at least a, uh, a week to moderate uh, La Nina event in the equatorial mm -hmm. Pacific. And more often than not, those, uh, those lead to a, a winter, a more a real winter type of uh, situation, the middle to the latter part of the winter. That's the, that's the long lead out. We, we actually, there's a new one we'll, that will be released later today. We'll talk about that next week, but I, I'm guessing that fairly high odds at that, what we just talked about is what we'll see from that today too. For temperature, that sounds good. What about precipitation for October through November, somewhere in there? No, there's, there's really no direction uh, right okay. now, cast direction. We, we, some of the con almost like confusion we see in the medium range. Some are drier than normal, some are a little wetter than normal. And there will be some periods in there like the last couple for central lower Michigan where we had above normal rain, but more of the state than not, uh, or at least in terms of area, 
was actually a little well. There certainly were areas of below normal too. So um, th there's there's not a firm there's just not a firm forecast direction on precip we could point at right now with any confidence. I think. Okay, very good, very good. I'd like to take this time to to thank Jeff and Marisol. Thank you very much for your excellent presentations. And I'd also like to invite any other uh, extension educators or specialists that are on. If you have an important, timely message, a relevant message that you want to get to our listeners, um, this is a really good time to to do that. The only one that I would like to mention, while well, maybe they're getting their thoughts together, would be um, harvest considerations for soybeans this year. We already mentioned that the moisture is going to drop pretty quickly. And if you're raising contract beans, like food grade beans, you will want to visit with your contractor and see how they want you to take those beans. Do they want you to take them a little bit earlier or at a little bit higher moisture content or not? But I would definitely be on the phone with my, my contractor if I was raising contract beans this year. The other thing I would consider is uh, some of the beans are lodging this year. And uh, we have problems up in the thumb. We have problems down the ir irrigated area and in between muck soils and such. It's not the worst lodging we've ever seen, but it is pretty significant and it will create some challenges at harvest. So um, we have some excellent materials, uh, articles written at MSUE News. So you just go to MSUE News and search soybean lodging and uh, you'll get the latest uh, recommendations on how to deal with that, uh, that situation. So, um, those would be the two things regarding soybean harvest that I would like to make you aware of. I guess there's one last one. We do have a soybean harvest equipment field day coming up in Breckenridge on the 28th. And it's an excellent opportunity to see how to reduce soybean harvest losses, either through maintenance, uh, management, or new equipment. So um, consider joining us for that. Any other questions or any other specialists want to make some timely and relevant uh, Okay, doesn't look like it. I really appreciate everybody joining us. And again, Jeff and Marisol, thank you very much.